And this is Alexa Adams Robertson. And I'm Jenny Lewis. And we're back with another edition of the Library's podcast, Checked Out. And today we're going to be talking about Modern Lovers by Emma Straub. This was Alexa and I. This was our summer reading, our beach reading, if you will, if either of us had gone to the beach. <laughs> Just sure didn't. No, it was good pool reading. Yeah. <laughs> if nothing else. Exactly. Um, so Modern Lovers is about two couples and their children. Um, the couples have all been friends since college or right after college. Mm-hmm. Um, and Alexa, do you want to give a little bit of a synopsis of the, the plot? Sure, yeah. So uh, it follows four characters, Elizabeth and Andrew who are married, and then Zoe and Jane who are married. Um, Elizabeth, Andrew, and Zoe were all in a band together when they were in college. Um, they did have a fourth member of the band named Lydia who has passed away. The band is called Kitty's Mustache, which yes. just seems like the perfect college <laughs> band name. It is very pretentious, which is great. They do explain it in the book as well. It's even more pretentious than you might think it is. Um, and so now that Elizabeth, Andrew, and Zoe have grown up, their band has dissolved. They're married and living as middle-aged hipsters in Brooklyn, um, and they each have a child. Um, Jane and Zoe have a daughter named Ruby, and Elizabeth, Andrew, have a son named Harry, and... Harry has developed a crush on Ruby. And so this book is kind of explores uh, middle-aged couples having to kind of pass the torch of independence, of youth, all of that stuff that they kind of associate with themselves from their college years being cool and in a band onto their own children. Um, So it was a really fascinating look into, I mean... I've lived in Kentucky my whole life. I have no clue what it's like to be a middle-aged hipster in Brooklyn. <laughs> um, so it was a really interesting look for me into something that I have no idea what it's like to live a life like that. Yeah, Zoe and Jane uh, run a restaurant. It seems like a cool, like, locavore kind of place mm-hmm. called Hyacinth. 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 Um, Jane is the chef, and Zoe sort of does all the decorations and the, I guess, designing kind mm-hmm. of the aspect of it. Um, they run it together. And uh, Elizabeth is a real estate agent, and their neighborhood is kind of an up-and-coming uh, neighborhood, kind of being turned trendy. Mm-hmm. So she's always on the go selling houses. Her husband kind of has not really had a, a job or a career to speak of. He's constantly, I think, at the beginning of the book, he's thinking about going to become an apprentice to a butcher. And then he thinks, no, maybe I'll do woodworking this mm-hmm. time. He comes from family money, uh, which helps kind of supplement his lifestyle, I think, a little bit, um, even though he hates his parents. Oh my uh, gosh, yeah. From the get-go. Uh, talks about how much he can't stand them. Um, but he also was a very involved, kind of basically stay-at-home dad when their son was small. Um, and that took up a lot of his time. And now that Harry is grown, he's or almost grown, he's getting ready to be a senior in high school, he's kind of trying to figure out what he wants to do with his life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was something really interesting when we were talking about the book before the podcast, is that you were talking about... Um, Andrew kind of not having his own identity Mm -hmm. because, I mean, he came from this money and he's always had this trust fund, so he's never really needed to kind of strike out and figure out who he is. And then when he got married to Elizabeth, he was the husband, and then they had Harry, and his whole life has been kind of wrapped up in all of these other people. And so he's never really developed who he is outside of those sort of parameters. No, and it's hard not to be frustrated with him, at least for the first half of the book, because yeah. when he talks about himself, it's in a, it is that very self-absorbed kind of stereotypical hipster way of, I don't want to be a slave to the man. And <laughs> He's a little get, frustrated. I don't want to get a corporate job and be lame like my parents and try to hang on to youth, but he is doing the exact same thing. He is exactly trying to hang on to youth. <laughs> Um, early on in the book, a I guess it's a yoga studio, but it kind of seems a little bit like a cult moves in a couple <laughs> blocks away. Um, they have this very vague sign posted on a lamppost about, like, we are here, are you? And he <laughs> tracks him down and finds that it's like a juice bar slash yoga studio, and he immediately gets very involved, starts going to, like, meditation classes, mm-hmm. and initially his wife is cool with it and she's happy he's got you know another hobby but then Elizabeth starts to even have some questions and kind of go what why is he spending all his time with these like 22 year olds you know in yoga pants Elizabeth is a lot more supportive than I think I would be in that scenario oh, absolutely which is very to Elizabeth's credit she gives him a lot of range to be who he is and figure it out so it's not that's what's so frustrating about Andrew to me is it's like he hasn't figured out who he is and he really really wants to he could. He could literally at any time. It's yeah, just like and she, she makes it, they sort of allude in the book that he's gone on these like trips before and he's climbed mountains and he's done all these things right. and still hasn't really. He's running from something. We don't know what it is. 
uh, at this point in the book. But he is, he's running from, clearly running from something and no amount of, you know, workshops on meditation are going to help him find it. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the big plot points that comes up early in, in the book is that the fourth member of their, their college band, Lydia, um, once college ended, she went off on her own and had a solo career. And it was a very brief but very lucrative solo career. Um, I almost think of her as like a, I guess like a Liz Fair or mm-hmm. like a Fiona Apple. Yeah. And, um, very like young and angry and, you know, I guess probably it was just the height of grunge mm-hmm. when she was a thing. Um, and she dies of, a, of an overdose at 27. They talk about her joining the 27 Club with like Kurt Cobain. And um, so now, um, flash forward to present day, someone's going to make a movie about her life mm-hmm. and they need everyone to sign over the life rights so this movie can be made right. and Zoe does it Elizabeth does it and the holdout is Andrew mm-hmm. he doesn't want to do it yeah and that's kind of the driving force behind the whole novel there there isn't so much a, like a huge big plot conflict it's very much like yeah, a slice of life these yeah. are these people going about their day to day it takes place over one summer mm-hmm. um, in the, the course of just a couple months and there's no like you said there's no big plot yeah twist or big plot you know um Nothing, nothing huge or, or totally life-changing happens, but it's about how their lives really shift over the course of the summer. And Andrew's reasons at first for not signing the contract are so lame. Yeah. Elizabeth is thinking, like, our son's going off to college, and we could really use the money, and that would be, you know, just a nice kind of safety net. And Andrew is, is like, no, I don't want to be, I don't want to turn over the rights to the man mm-hmm. and corporations and, and this, that, and the other. And you just kind of roll your eyes at him a lot. It's so hard to side with Andrew over Elizabeth for a lot of reasons, but Elizabeth's reasons for signing the paper to make the movie are so good. Mm-hmm. Number one, it's Elizabeth's song. Absolutely. She wrote it she by wrote herself. She wrote the song. So the, the song that, a, that uh, Lydia becomes super famous for, um, Mistress to Myself, mm-hmm. is actually one that Elizabeth wrote. Yeah, and she just let Lydia have she, it. Yeah. Um, and then also, I mean, it. I mean, Elizabeth... Her main reason is that she wants to empower young girls. Yeah, I mean that's she says it multiple times over the book. She's just like I. I remember writing that song. I was a young adult in college, and it was so empowering for me. And she just keeps imagining girls watching this movie and feeling that same thing, and, and knowing picking that picking up they, a guitar. Yeah, yeah and, and it's just like Elizabeth cool. has all the good reasons, and Andrew just yes. like it's. Just, he, he's holding back, and it, when you find out later in the book why, yeah. it makes a lot more sense than any of his lame reasons that totally. he gives at the beginning. It totally. makes complete sense when he says why. <laughs> so when the, the book starts, um, another, another big focus of this book really is just relationships and how they change mm-hmm. over the course of a lifetime, and Jane and uh, Zoe seem destined for divorce. They are not really speaking to each other. Zoe tells Elizabeth she wants to go apartment shopping, their daughter's graduating, and they just she just feels like there's nothing holding them together anymore. And you feel like, by the end of the book, you're going to have seen them split up. Um, Andrew and Elizabeth seem pretty rock solid, pretty strong. Um, but then as the, the book, as the summer unfolds, um, the couples kind of start to unravel and come back together in surprising ways. Um, Andrew and Elizabeth start having a lot of problems um, in, around really signing over the life rights. Um, to this, so this movie can be made. Mm-hmm. Um, and we find out, I think, almost about halfway to towards the end of the book that um, Andrew actually, while dating Elizabeth, was actually having an affair with what, I guess having an affair seems really torrid when you're in college. But yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was messing around with Lydia on right. the side um, yeah. while still being with Elizabeth, um, which finally explains to Elizabeth why Lydia was always so cold to her. Mm-hmm. But also it's this giant secret that Andrew had kept hidden from her for mm-hmm. decades. And it really does explain why Andrew was pushing back so hard against the movie being made because he finds out that the Hollywood studio has Lydia's journals. Right. Which <laughs> include a lot of things about Andrew yep. um, that happened while he was supposed to be dating Elizabeth and only yep. Elizabeth. Yep. Um, and I think one of the most interesting things about that is one of the questions that we've been kind of tossing around is, what would have changed had Andrew been honest with Elizabeth at the beginning of their relationship? What if Elizabeth had gone into the relationship knowing everything that Andrew had had, had indiscretions with Lydia? I don't necessarily think that would have been a deal breaker for Elizabeth. 
They were in yeah. college. Um, and and they went to Oberlin, which is a, <laughs> which I feel like is something to also bring up because their, their college experience was vastly different from, I think, the college experience of 90% of other uh, Americans. Oberlin is its own its own unique subculture. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah. No, I think they that could have been something they either worked through or yeah. maybe not worked through, but it definitely would have altered the course of, of what is happening in the novel. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Because, I mean, that's like... That's, like, the biggest problem is that Andrew's just not telling anyone the truth. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew just spends the entire novel lying to himself. He lies to everyone. And it's just, like, I mean, the plot basically wouldn't have even happened if Andrew had just been honest. <laughs> yeah, well, Elizabeth has spent so much time defending him and yes. trying to support him and feels like they have this really open and honest relationship where they know everything about one another. And to find out that your partner has been hiding this secret from you for decades mm-hmm. and maybe he's not the person you thought you married, that's a huge deal absolutely Um, and it has elizabeth start to question a lot of things she's she to me is kind of the consummate adult in all of the um in all of the couples she's the one with the responsible job um she's thinking you know frugally about their Mm -hmm. future their financial future putting harry through college all this stuff and so i think she starts to question have I what have I given up of myself mm-hmm. you know she gave away her song yeah. she gave away her youth and and a lot of her dreams to kind of be the practical responsible real estate agent mm-hmm. and pay the bills and now she's going well wait a minute why did I sacrifice all this for yeah. someone who couldn't even be honest with me exactly yeah and I mean it is imp- I, I think that Elizabeth likes her job I mean sure. I, I which I think is really admirable I mean she's done so much and she's given up so much and she's still making a life for herself. She's being a responsible adult, making money, and she's still happy with her life choices yeah. that she's made. And it's, I think that's kind of like the antithesis of Andrew, who is just living off of this money that he inherited, did nothing to get, and still isn't happy. Yeah. Still can't figure out what he wants to do. Um, I mean, and now that Harry, their son, is about to graduate and go off to college, I think it's really kind of like this panic-inducing moment for him where it's like, well, without that one thing, without Harry... Who am I? Who am I? What, what am I doing? What do I have? Yeah. Which does make me, as much as he annoys me, he annoyed me <laughs> all throughout the book. Pretty much. He, I, I felt a little bit of sympathy for him when I looked at him through that lens, mm-hmm. lens as the person who had been, you know, the stay-at-home parent and put a lot of himself into his child and now his child, but without really looking for um, anything for himself. So now that the child is going off to school and doesn't really need him anymore, he's sort of then kind of going, oh, well, what am I going to do now? Right. Um, so there's there's definitely some sympathy there. I, I I do have issues with the fact that what he decides to do with his life is go um, join a cult, essentially, um, and try to, <laughs> you know, sell some shady kombucha. But uh, but that's what that's what the choice he makes. He goes off and finds this yoga studio with this very charismatic leader named Dave, mm-hmm. um, who we find out uh, is kind of shady. Very kind, shady. Kind of really shady, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Basically sucks Andrew in and then wants Andrew to give him lots of money for these mm-hmm. various schemes and plans he has to build, like, a community. I mean, basically, like, a cult. Yeah, I mean, it's... A commune, I guess, is a better word. Yeah, it's very kind of, uh, like, up in the air throughout the entire time, which, I mean, is very accurate, I think, of how the actual process of getting kind of pulled into this commune sure. sort of Ponzi scheme that Dave has going. I think that that's pretty accurate reflection of it, where you go one day and it's like, oh, man, do some yoga with us. Oh, hey, here's this kombucha that we're selling. Um, Here's this other thing. And Dave... I th- or I think that Andrew really feels kind of like he's found his purpose. He's this cool older guy who can mm-hmm. do all this stuff for these young he's kids. He's building bookshelves for yeah. them. Yeah, he's just kind of like their impromptu carpenter that they yes. have around. And it's, it's such a strange part-time job that yes. he's found for himself. But really, I mean, it, it fulfills him for the time that he spends well, and we with should, those characters. We should back up a little bit and say the whole reason we find out that there's a really shady element to it is because of Ruby, mm-hmm. Jane and Elizabeth's, um, Jane and Zoe's daughter, mm-hmm. um, who at the beginning of the book seems like a total screw up. Yeah. She has not gotten into any of the colleges she applied to. You find out it's because her essay, <laughs> her college application essay was basically, uh, I don't want to go to college. Yes. College is a waste of my time. <laughs> Neither of her mothers bothered to proofread her essay, and they're shocked when she doesn't get in. 
Um, so she's being forced to spend the summer after graduation taking a, like a remedial SAT course mm-hmm. to try to improve her scores and get in somewhere. But she's constantly, she knows her parents are going to divorce, and she's kind of fed up with both of them, and she just flits around like, like she, her actions don't matter on, and don't, you know, affect anyone else. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she begins this relationship with Harry, mm-hmm. and I think Harry's the one who really, she starts to see that she... She kind of takes him on as a side project at first. Yeah. You get annoyed with her. You're like, you've known this kid your whole life, and now you're just messing with him. You know he's in love with you. Mm -hmm. Um, But she really matures a lot over the course of the summer and develops feelings for Harry Mm -hmm. and realizes that her actions have an effect on other people and starts to grow up. And she gets curious about what Andrew's, where Andrew's spending all his time, and she starts investigating this yoga studio, like a a Nancy Drew, (laughs) being a teenage sleuth. (laughs) Uh, and figures out that Dave is actually not, like, a licensed yoga guru. He's an actor. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is just the latest and kind of, like, a long line of money-making schemes he's come up with. Mm-hmm. I would read an entire book of Ruby, like, doing detective work. To be I totally would. I totally <laughs> would. Yeah, once she kind of lost her t- really, really tough exterior mm-hmm. show and started having some actual feelings for people, yeah. I liked her a lot more. She's a really sweet character, and I, I like... I like Ruby because I like characters that push plot forward. Yes. And Ruby is great at that. She's yes. just like, here's a bunch of pictures. Let's sell them on eBay. See what happens. Exactly. Like, <laughs> here's exactly. a yoga studio. I'm going to go in and make friends with everyone. Give them a fake name. Like, exactly. She, she does a lot of stuff in this she novel. Does. <laughs> she's someone that, yeah, she's someone that you, you would have wanted to have been friends with in college just mm-hmm. because you knew things were never going to be dull. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she and, and Harry are a, a funny little couple because Harry is like the penultimate golden child. He's just good. Mm-hmm. He doesn't do anything. You know, his friends are all kind of nerdy. They play video games together. He's willingly taking, spending the summer taking this SAT course. Mm-hmm. Yes, that, and that's, that is something that Harry is also in the SAT course that Ruby is forced to take over right, the summer right. because Harry chose to. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's becoming a senior high school. He's not even going to college yet, and he's, like, taking it for the second time, like, trying to get those to scores get up. better scores. Yeah. yeah. He's very practical. He's very smart. He's very sweet. He's very he close is. to both of his parents. Um, he's just an all-around really good kid. He's, he's mm-hmm. the kind of, he's what you want your, your kids to kind of grow up to be in their teenage years. Um, and my, one of my favorite moments takes place in one of the first chapters of the book when, uh, Ruby's shady, shady pseudo (laughs) boyfriend shows up to graduation to try to cause a scene and Harry out of nowhere just punches him. Yes. Just takes him out. And it's so beautiful. And so everyone is so shocked by it. You you have to love a scene when a guy named Dust gets punched in the face and knocked to the ground. Absolutely do. (laughs) He rides around on a skateboard throughout the majority of the novel. Yeah. (laughs) Um, one of the, the things that Emma Straub does that I just loved is that she, things don't wrap up at the end in a tidy, neat little bow, mm-hmm. but she has an epilogue of short, of sorts that she calls ephemera, and it's uh, little, like, newspaper articles about the characters after the book has wrapped up, mm-hmm. and one of them is that, it took me a minute to figure out who she was talking about, <laughs> but Dust... And another one of Ruby's stoner friends mm-hmm. have are getting it's their wedding announcement, mm-hmm. and you find out that Dust's real name is like Anthony Dostensky, and he's right. going to architecture school at Columbia, and the girl is like graduated from college and is uh, doing like PR for a Rastafarian juice yeah. company. Which I just loved seems it. So New York, <laughs> it's not even funny. But 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 they just made me laugh a lot. I uh, yeah. I mean, I think that. All of this stuff w- involving Jane and Zoe and Elizabeth and Andrew and their marriages and everything, it's really, really well done. And I really love the teenagers just as mm-hmm. much, which I, I think is too. really impressive. One of my favorite parts was um, uh, Ruby and Harry's tryst in the park. Yes, they get they get busted <laughs> um, having having sex. It is Harry's first time. They get busted in the park. But, and it is actually a very sweet scene. It and is. And Straub writes it really well. It's so charming. Um, but their parents have to come pick them up from the police <laughs> station. And I think that's one of the things that I, I love about the way she wrote the teenagers is they're, she manages to get the angst and the, the feelings of being that age, but not pandering to it. Not right. looking down on them, not, you know, 
coming at them from a grown-up's perspective of you just need to grow up and live your life. Mm-hmm. She she has a lot of respect for that time period in yeah. someone's life. Yeah, Harry's just like, guys, this is the first time I've ever messed up. It's fine. Like, yeah. and he comes at it from such a rational point of view. It's like, well, he's right. I mean, he's True. voluntarily taking an SAT class this it's summer. True. Um, Andrew really doesn't handle that the best. Um, everything's kind of coming to a head for Andrew, I yes, think, at, at that, that point. at that point in the novel. Um, and he really takes out a lot of his frustrations on Zoe and Jane. Yeah. Um, he kind of blames them for raising Ruby to be this hellion who... This wild child. Yeah, who takes Harry under her wing and is totally ruining him her life. And it's it's a really low point, I think, for the adults in the novel, where it's such a yeah. high point for Harry. It is. You feel like the, this is the turning point where the kids have started really... It's kind of a growing up point for them. Mm-hmm. But for the adults, it's a it's a sign of them, their immaturity. Absolutely. Um, and, and as you mentioned, so Andrew has found this yoga cult... Um, Elizabeth is actually at some point forges his name on the paper so that the movie can be made and she's eventually got to come to terms with that and confess what she's done mm-hmm. um, and Joey I'm sorry it's Jane and Zoe which their couple name should be Joey Joey that's a great I couple like name for them <laughs> um, they have started to really unravel and and you think are definitely going to split up and then this sort of scene happens this event happens and um, Zoe and Jane start to kind of work it out. Mm-hmm. They start to have more conversations. They start to, I think one of them calls their therapist on vacation repeatedly. And yes. The therapist calls them back and suggests they start going out on dates. And they start to rekindle their romance. And you, you, it's nice. You, you think they're totally doomed. Mm-hmm. And then you see that they're actually, they can work it out. And it's, it might actually be something that they can save. Mm-hmm. I really loved that shift because... Um, at the beginning of the book, you get a lot of Jane through other people. Mm-hmm. You you see a lot of Zoe just being stuck in her marriage, and Jane, all she does is work, and she never takes Zoe out on dates anymore, and so they're just kind of stuck in this rut. And Zoe's just fed up at the beginning mm-hmm. of the novel with her marriage. Um, and you, you don't really get very flattering pictures of her through Andrew or Elizabeth either. And then you finally get Jane in her first chapter, and Jane's lovely. Mm-hmm. Like, she's a normal woman who's running a restaurant, and she loves cooking, and she's so passionate about it. And I really loved by the way, Jane's descriptions of food in her mm-hmm. chapters. I mean, it's like you can really tell that she's such a passionate character and she's got all this stuff that she cares. She, so, she loves Ruby so much mm-hmm. and she's really worried about Zoe and she loves Zoe so much. And whenever they finally start working out, I was so thrilled because yeah. it was like, I was I was with Zoe at the beginning. I was like, oh, I'm sick of Jane too. I've never even met Jane and I'm sick of her. And then when you meet her, you're like, no, Jane's great. Work it out. She's like, yeah. this is a great marriage, Zoe. You've well, done so good. Exactly. Jane just seems very adult. Yeah. And very. Andrew and Zoe come from the place, both come from money. Yes. Zoe's mother was a, um, is a famous singer um, and very beautiful, glamorous person. And I, it, it almost feels like both had very, they're both, they're growing up as kind of stilted. And, yes. And, they, they have a lot of adulting left to do. <laughs> right. um, and so they're trying to kind of work through that at this point in their lives. Whereas Jane and Elizabeth had very boring, normal suburban childhoods mm-hmm. and now have kind of come into their own and already are adults. Mm-hmm. Elizabeth maybe too much, but they're <laughs> trying to work it out. And um, yeah, I was just really happy to see them have that, that turnaround. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the big thing happens, their restaurant uh, gets burned to the ground yes. by... Dust and his stoner girlfriend. <laughs> Who later get married. Who later get married. <laughs> may, have, may or may not have been on accident. Um, there's a story of firecrackers and, yeah. The fairies by a fence. Yeah, all and, kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, but that they sort of decide at that point to come together and really uh, fix the restaurant and restore it and um, open a bakery as well, mm-hmm. um, which is really sweet. It is, yeah. I mean, it's... Kind of one of those things where when it happens, and Ruby's there for it. Ruby is the, one of the people who's closing down the restaurant on the night that it burns down. So Ruby's the one. I, I believe that Ruby actually is the one who calls nine one one whenever she discovers it, and all of the other employees find out that what's happening. Um, and it's kind of one of those moments when you're just like, oh, well, their marriage has been going downhill, and this big catastrophic thing has happened. This is it. This is it. This, this is, is going to be what. This is going to be their chance to walk away. Yeah. If if they don't have ISN, then they don't have anything right. left holding because they both work there. So it's like if the one place that's holding them together is gone, then what and, do they have and left? Zoe says multiple times throughout the book, even when talking to her therapist. But what happens if we split up? Where do I work? And yeah. The therapist is like, you don't have to work at ISN, <laughs> right? You know, or you don't have to be married to still work there, right? Um. So yeah, you think okay, well this place is burned to the ground. They're done. Mm-hmm. Um. But they're not. 
Yeah, and it, it really does. It, I think it brings them closer together than yeah. just about anything else in the book. I mean, they do call their therapist a lot, and they do start making an effort, and they take notes in their little notebooks mm-hmm. about all the dates that they go on, which I think is so cute. Um, but, I mean, they actually have to be proactive when Hyacinth uh, gets damaged in the fire because they actually have to do something actively to fix their their. I mean, their source of money. I mean, they actually do have to work together yeah. to bring it back to life and make it better than ever. Um, and I think it's really... I, I believe that they mentioned in the novel that Hyacinth was going to be their... If they ever had another child, they That's were going to... Name and her. I think it's really interesting that their restaurant is named after a child that they didn't have, yeah. and that's kind of what ends up bringing them together. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a nice little nuance that was added in there. Yeah, I liked that a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Whereas Elizabeth and Andrew continue to kind of spiral out of control, and we eventually Elizabeth does have to confess and tell Andrew that, in fact, you know she forged his name on these documents, mm-hmm. and, and the movie is probably going to get made, and he's he needs to go along with it. Um, the journals come to light. Andrew has to confess that he he was having an affair, messing around with Lydia, while at the same time being with Elizabeth, um, and that's devastating mm-hmm. for Elizabeth to come to terms with. We also find out that he has invested a sizable chunk of money <laughs> oh. into this yoga Andrew. studio. Um, and right about the time Dave gets arrested for um, selling, like, bad kombucha? I believe that is what they got him for, is that they were selling kombucha, like, without a license. Because yeah. it's fermented, and you're supposed to, like, be doing it in sterile conditions. And he was basically doing it in the basement of, like, a rundown it house. Like, it was, like, homebrew kombucha. Yeah. A lot shady. A lot shady, actually. <laughs> a lot shady. Um... So th- th- his his whole kind of existence is kind of spiraling at that point. And mm-hmm. you also but you also find out that Elizabeth and Zoe in college, their relationship has always been they've been always been the best of friends. Mm-hmm. Andrew seems like he's always been a little jealous and a, they thought that their relationship is a little bit weird. Yes. Maybe a little bit too close, almost like Elizabeth really worships Zoe. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very worshipful. And then you find out that they had this one night in college. Zoe doesn't even really remember it, but they there was a chance of a hookup, mm-hmm. um, for lack of a better word. And it doesn't happen. It gets interrupted. And Elizabeth, you know, stays with Andrew. Mm-hmm. And so there's always been this little bit of what might have been, I think, in Elizabeth, back of Elizabeth's mind. Yeah. And now finding out that her husband was cheating on her the whole time. She's like, well, what was it so all for then? What was all this for? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I could have had Zoe this whole time. Exactly. <laughs> and I've been stuck with Andrew. I'm stuck with this guy. He's going off to cosmic trances on Friday yeah. nights at the yoga studio. <laughs> it really does feel like Elizabeth has just been dwelling on that one instance. Mm-hmm. And you don't even realize it because you don't find out about this night until like the last quarter of the book and suddenly everything kind of makes sense with yeah. how just kind of clingy Zo- Elizabeth is to Zoe and she's so worried when Zoe's looking for an apartment at the beginning she's helping her find this apartment she's like what am I going to do if Zoe moves away right. I walk over to their house all the time and I hang out with Zoe and Zoe's her best friend and so when you finally find out that they had that kind of moment it's like Oh, now Elizabeth makes sense. Yeah, it's like <laughs> now the I understand. one thing that Jane and Andrew have in common is that both of them find <laughs> yes. the Zoe Elizabeth relationship to be a little bit strange. Yeah. A little bit codependent. Yes. Um, even for, you know, people who've been best friends for 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you find out that, and then it, it's actually really sweet. Elizabeth gets mad. She finds out about Andrew. Mm-hmm. She flies off. She gets on a train and goes to basically interrupt. Yes. Jane and Zoe have taken a weekend away to work on their relationship. And Elizabeth interrupts it. Which is, I mean, hats off to Jane. What a trooper. I mean, she's just like, fine. Right. (laughs) Zoe gets the call and Zoe realizes this is not the most appropriate time to sort through this. But her best friend is just completely in agony. Mm -hmm. And this is a huge deal. And so she goes and picks her up. And they have, they're all together. And uh, Zoe, uh, Elizabeth gets incredibly drunk and tells uh, her about this night in college. And Mm -hmm. it's like, what could have been? And Zoe's like, I don't really remember it you know I yeah I thought you were great I you know I loved you then I love you now yeah but, you know it probably wasn't really gonna be a thing right and so um puts to bed a lot of that I and she gave I thought it was so sweet she gave her a kiss yeah at, at the end of yeah. Elizabeth's and well she makes the big speech while she's drunk and then the next morning they kind of talk yeah. about it again and so yeah. he's like I, I love you I've always loved you and she gives her a kiss and it I you really felt the closure for Elizabeth. Yeah, After absolutely. After she, she finally got it out of her system. Absolutely. <laughs> finally talked about it. Yeah. It comes out. And, um, 
Yeah, they have a they have a sweet moment. And it's so you sweet. really feel like their friendship then will continue. Absolutely. This is close, if not closer than ever. Yeah, and it kind of I think it made Jane feel better too. Yeah. Because Jane was there for the drunken telling of the story, and she, Jane was like, "This is great. It's all finally coming yeah, out." Like, now I understand yeah. why the relationship is so weird. So it was like, "Oh, good. Jane and Zoe and Elizabeth are fine. Like that's all been worked out. Right. Jane doesn't have to be like." kind of weird and territorial about everything anymore, yes. which, yes. yeah. <laughs> so Yeah, because one, one of the critiques of Jane early on is that she is kind of territorial about Zoe, but, na- the, but then you get to this point in the book, you're like, oh, I see now why. Because really, good, with not, good reason. They have had a weird vibe. <laughs> yeah. They're not just best friends who drink wine together on the porch on Friday. Like, there, there's something else going on here. Right. Um, so, yeah, you feel like Jane's a little bit justified. Absolutely. So, the book wraps up. Kind of ambiguously, um, Ruby has decided, well, Harry, bless his heart, <laughs> proposes it's to Ruby. So sweet. At 17. Um, <laughs> still in high school. Still in high school, <laughs> proposes, and Ruby says, I'm going to go sail around Mexico. Yep. Just decides. Awesome. Um, I think she really realized she needed to grow up, mm-hmm. and that maybe this was the only way to do it was to force herself. Um, so she and Harry stay together for the rest of the summer, and Ruby goes off mm-hmm. and sail to sail her ship, her I don't remember what it is, but she some kind of like special course. Yeah, and um, for uh, teenagers. From what I can tell from the in from our little news clippings at the end of the week, I don't think she ever came back from Mexico. No, it <laughs> seems like she goes to Mexico. She sails around Mexico, mm-hmm. uh, decides to stay long term, and ends up opening a, a pizza joint mm-hmm. in Mexico yes. called Brooklyn's Finest. Uh, which I think is really, really sweet. Kind of a sweet tribute to her her neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, her greatest fear was always becoming her parents, and she has become her parents. Yep. She's become her mother's. And good for her. Good for her. <laughs> and she's happy and mature. Mm-hmm. And they had that little blurb from her that her mom and her mom always come down and visit her once a year, yeah. see the sides of Mexico, and she goes home for a Thanksgiving dinner, not on Thanksgiving, because when would the people of Mexico exactly. get their Brooklyn pizza exactly. if she were closed on Thanksgiving? <laughs> it's a, it's really sweet. It um, is. And so you, you find out she's really grown into a mature person and, and is in a good place. Harry, we find out, is at, um, I forget which school, he's proposing an honors thesis about um, called Modern Lovers. Yes. And it is going to be about, um, I think he, he says at some point, it's kind of like if Romeo and Juliet didn't kill themselves. <laughs> so it's like right. <laughs> teenage love versus adult middle age love. Mm-hmm. Um, he's, he seems to be doing really well. Elizabeth, we find out, has gone back out on tour that the movie about Lydia has become very successful. And all these people have now discovered, rediscovered Elizabeth mm-hmm. uh, because she wrote the song. And she has a new album out and is going on tour playing at the Bowery Ballroom. So she must be doing pretty well. Absolutely. No mention of Andrew there. <laughs> no. The only mention of Andrew comes that he's coaching um, a Big Brothers basketball team. Mm-hmm. He's doing like Big Brothers Big Sisters. And he's coaching a team, mm-hmm. basketball team, which is great for him. Yeah. To have, I think, you know, we, that may be all we ever find out about Andrew is that he's going to go through the rest of his life kind of adrift. Fine with me. Sure. <laughs> Good for you, Andrew. Sure. At least you can be helpful while you do that. Exactly. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, and Jane and Zoe's restaurant, Hyacinth, is thriving, mm-hmm. and so is their, their cute little bakery. Yes. Um, so everyone, it is it is very much an ambiguous ending for one couple in the book, mm-hmm. um, which I thought was really interesting. I really loved um, kind of the final real-world ex- example of Andrew and Elizabeth that you get is them finally going to therapy together. Yeah. And <laughs> Elizabeth's just like, let me talk. Like, yeah. just, just listen to me for a minute, Andrew. And it's such a great moment. So it's just like the whole book. It's just like they're all they're together so much in the book, but they never really talk about anything. Mm. Elizabeth will bring up the documentary. Andrew will run away. Yeah. And it's just they, like. They talk about how he just walks out all the time when they yeah. fight. He walks away. And that's so just frustrating. Infuriating. Yeah, it really is. And at one point she tells him, I think that the therapist asks Andrew to compliment her, and he does, and then he starts to go off, and she's like, no, keep going. Just yeah. keep talking. Keep talking. Yeah. He's it's, got a lot to make up for. He does. It's so <laughs> empowering for Elizabeth. You're yeah. You're kind of fist pumping. Like, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Get what you deserve, Elizabeth. You could have had Zoe all this time, and you've been stuck with Andrew, so you need something to make up for those 25 years that you've just been stuck in. I mean, it's like, there has to have been something there. Absolutely. But we don't really we see, don't see a see lot it of it. So, <laughs> I mean, the closest we really get is whenever they've, at the beginning of the novel, they've kind of started writing songs together again yeah. in their garage. But even then, Andrew's kind of a jerk about it. Like, he mentions that Elizabeth, like, looks weird when she closes her eyes and sings. Or, but he does talk about how he, he thinks that she is incredibly talented. Yes. He recognizes her talent. It's true. 
Um, and I kind of wonder if maybe Elizabeth, if they're not supposed to, re- if they're not supposed to be the ones who represent Romeo and Juliet in this, and maybe, you know, people talk about Romeo and Juliet um, critically as being very si- a bunch about two very silly teenagers mm-hmm. who, you know, if they had just kind of waited and grown a little bit in five years, really wouldn't have even, you know, felt that great about one another. And you sort of feel like maybe Elizabeth is Juliet. Maybe she was in love with being in love. Yeah. And and in love with having this boyfriend. And Andrew seemed cooler and more worldly. And um, she just kind of convinced herself that was the life that she wanted. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of moments like that for Elizabeth mm-hmm. in the book where she just kind of is like quietly introspective, thinking about what led her to this. Mm-hmm. Like how, how did this happen to her? Um, I mean, it, it really was just kind of like she just let life happen. She mm-hmm. started dating Andrew because he was there, and they kept dating, and then he proposed, so she married him, and it, it's it's like life kind of happened to Elizabeth. Yeah, I think it's a nice meditation kind of on middle age, maybe mm-hmm. even in marriage, and, and you can get to be a certain point in your life and look, turn around and go, how did I get here? Right. Like, what what happened? Yeah. I think of that, that um, what's that song? Is it by the Cars? It's where he's like, this is not my beautiful life or something like that. Yeah. Like this, he kind of looks around like, where am I? And How did this happen? Yeah. That's sort of where I think she is mm-hmm. a little bit. And you really get the, I mean, obviously it's confirmed in our little epilogue that she she finally goes out and does something for herself. She sings these songs and she writes new ones and she's, she's living her life. But I mean, you really get the sense at the end of the novel that she's finally taking control over what's happening to her. Absolutely. And it's about time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's a really good feeling that you... You leave the book knowing that the characters that you've been following who've been so wishy-washy and arguing and in these unhappy marriages, they're not just letting that happen to them anymore. Absolutely. They're, they're actively working on their marriage. They're writing down notes in their notebooks after they go on date nights and they're going to therapy and they're working it out. They're not just settling for the marriages that they're in. They're actively working to better themselves. Absolutely. And I should I should add that in a book that talks so much about music, it's not the cars that I just referenced. It's talking heads. <laughs> I was wondering why you were on your phone over there. Before someone sends me an angry email and says, how could you? I can't believe I would mess that up. You fixed it. It's fine. Yes, yes. Um, Who was your favorite of all of the characters? Who do you think did you kind of root for the entire time? Because really, for me, I mean, my opinions about a lot of them changed over the course of the book, as you said. Yeah, I was kind of the same. I mean, I definitively was not thrilled with Andrew the entire time. Right. Um, I, do you know, I really like Jane. Yeah. I, I She was pretty, like, consistent throughout as I was just like, yes, listen to Jane. Jane is making sense. Everyone mm-hmm. needs to be normal like her. I liked Ruby a lot, too, though. Yeah. Um, e- even from the beginning when she was being, like, an obnoxious 18-year-old who flubbed her college essay on purpose. I, I even like that, Ruby. Um, I, I, I thought she's she was charming. great. She's, she's very really charming in her own way. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and whenever she decided to kind of make Harry her project, I was like, yes, this is this is the sort of plot for a book I can get behind. Um, it, was, it was very fun. I was team Harry the whole way. Yeah. I think, yeah, something about kind of his steadiness. I was like, you're doing something right, kid. Yeah. You're smart, and you're, 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 I don't know, you're going to make it after all. He was just so earnest. Yeah, despite his parents being kind of <laughs> giant screw-ups in a lot of yeah. ways. Um, but I think it's, I think that's the kind of the one takeaway that from their relationship that you get that maybe the combo of their personalities managed to raise a really great kid. You know, Andrew yeah. was fun and free-spirited and kind of the ultimate playmate, and Elizabeth was organized and detailed and um the one who kind of had the follow through and Mm -hmm. but still you know very supportive and very loving and they've managed to raise this great kid so they've they've done some their relationship has done something right exactly yeah and I mean I think there are several times when Andrew and I think probably Elizabeth says it too in the book where it's just like if not they did Andrew like Mm -hmm. or, or they did Harry like if nothing else like they created Harry and like they even mentioned they don't even want to have a second kid because they have Harry. Like exactly. they did it so right the first time. Exactly. Why would they need a second child? He's perfect. And it's just like, I mean, they for for the fact that Andrew has been keeping a lie yeah. bottled up within him for like decades. Like they did something right. One of the things that I think is so um, great about the the Elizabeth transformation is that so the book the song that she writes Mistress of Myself has apparently this chorus that that is so famous and well known that generations of 
angsty teens have gotten it tattooed all over their body. Um, but the chorus is, I will be calm, calm, calm. Mm-hmm. And it feels like that was Elizabeth's motto for her life, was I will be calm and I will, I will you know, be in control. And at the end, she's kind of ready to just say, you know what? I'm not going to be calm anymore. I'm yep. not going to be in control. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little bit um, outside my comfort zone and mm-hmm. I'm going to push back and I'm going to ask for what I want. And I don't know. It's a nice, it's a nice moment. It really is. I mean... Uh, I don't, neither one of us said that Elizabeth was our favorite character, but I think that she has the most, I, 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 she has the most intriguing story arc to me. Yeah. Because she starts out, it's kind of like, oh, Liz, it's like she's a real estate agent, and she's got all this, and she just kind she's of goes along. Bland. She's very vanilla. Yeah, and everyone says that about her, too, in the book. They're just mm-hmm. like, oh, it's just Elizabeth. She sells apartments in Brooklyn and mm-hmm. gentrifies the neighborhood and blah, 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 and she does all this stuff. And by the end, you're just like, yeah, like, get what you want, Elizabeth. Right? <laughs> like, you're really, door, putting yeah. Her skin, going to the bow, playing the Bowery Ballroom. It's amazing. Yeah. She has such a great story arc, um, and it's, I mean, if we're talking about story arc instead of character, definitely Elizabeth is my favorite. I mean, it's so great. Although Ruby sailing around Mexico is pretty awesome, too. (laughs) It it is. But I expect that of Ruby. That's true. I honestly didn't really expect Elizabeth to take that much control back over her life. That's true. After being with Andrew for so long. Um... What do you think that, how do you think Elizabeth, Andrew, and Zoe's lives would have been different if Lydia had lived? If this fourth kind of go, if this, I, I guess, for the three who went to college together, she's this fourth ghost character mm-hmm. who's, who's never there. But how do you think their lives would have been different? Gosh, I don't know. Do you know, I was thinking about that, and I don't know, I don't know if Elizabeth and Andrew would have been any different. I kind of feel like they still would have ended up together. Probably. I don't think, I don't think that Andrew had the guts to be with Lydia. No, she seemed like such a dynamic, forceful mm-hmm. personality. I think Andrew needed somebody that... Andrew's kind of, honestly, he's kind of a wimp. And yeah. He, but he needs somebody he can push back against. Mm-hmm. And storming out of the house makes him feel in control, and Elizabeth lets him do it. I don't think Lydia would have put up with that. Yeah, and it's just like, if... It, even if she'd lived, I mean, she was alive for a good portion of their college lives. He was yeah. with her. It's like, if he was going to be with her and leave Elizabeth, he would have done, done it. He would have done it. I yeah. mean, he was like... He was sneaking around with her for a while, it seems like, based on those journals and the the kind of, like, flashbacks that we get from the college years. It's just, like, I don't I don't think that he had, I don't think he had the guts to be with, Liz, with Lydia. I think she was too much for no, him. No, I think their band still would have split up. I think they yeah. probably would have gotten more attention in their middle as they, as, as her life continued to evolve and change and she mm-hmm. would continue to get more famous. They may have gotten dragged into things. Yeah, it would have been like a Keith Richards, like, hey, come join me for a reunion tour. Like, Yeah, oh. it would have been like yeah. pulled in, I think, occasionally, and that may have affected their relationships a little bit more. And maybe right. at some point Lydia would have told Elizabeth. We don't know. Yeah, I mean, we have this really horrible flashback of the last time that Elizabeth and Andrew saw Lydia before she passed away. And it's just like Lydia saw them in a restaurant, and Elizabeth... I think Harry was a little boy at the time. Mm-hmm. She was, So they had, like, this little baby with them, and Lydia was just very disdainful and cold yeah. and just, like, wanted nothing to do with Elizabeth. She kind of was a little bit warmer towards Andrew. Obviously, we know why now. Um, and it's just this really horrible moment, and it's just like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how it would have worked out. <laughs> I don't know that around. Zoe's life would have been any different. Because Zoe <laughs> seems like an an- ancillary part of the band. It's true. She Zoe just kind of did her own thing. Yeah. I think she still would have been married to Jane, and they still would have been having opening a restaurant, and, you know, maybe mm-hmm. Lydia would have occasionally dropped in to have some, you know, polenta, but... Right. And, it, a... I mean, they even mentioned, like, when they were still in the band, Zoe got bored of it pretty quick. Yeah. Zoe went off. Zoe was like, all right, I'm through with this, and she kind of went off and did her own thing, even while Lydia was still alive. I mean... Yeah, I think Zoe, for her, it was just, like trying to maybe relive a little bit of her mom. Exactly. And then she was done with it. I'm done. (laughs) She's like, all right, I don't want to be my mom anymore. Yeah. (laughs) I think Zoe and Ruby are a lot alike. Yes, absolutely. And I think that a lot of the characters think that as well, including Jane. Yes. Well, I think it's funny because I think Jane and Harry are a lot alike. Yeah. So I do kind of wonder if long term, if maybe there wouldn't be something between Ruby and Harry down the line. Maybe Harry goes and moves to Mexico with with Ruby or something. It's, it's a nice thought. I, I just think that, the, yeah, there's a, there are a lot of similarities there. Yeah, he could really ground her. <laughs> somebody somebody probably needs to. Yeah. <laughs> what did you think about Elizabeth forging Andrew's signature? I mean, at that point, I was so fed up with Andrew. I was like, good. 
Yeah, I did get the him. documentary made. Your reasons are way better than his <laughs> because at that point we didn't know yet that he didn't want it to be made because he didn't want that to be how Elizabeth found out Some about his affair. Yeah, yeah, he was he was embarrassed. He'd kept this lie for decades upon decades, and he was like, "This is how my wife is going to find out that I've been lying to her for our entire marriage." Um, so I mean, it makes sense. Those are really good reasons to not want it to be made, but we didn't know that yet. So I was True. just like, "Good, get the True. documentary made." <laughs> We talked about the the messages the book has about marriage and and love and and middle age, but self-image is another big, Mm -hmm. um, important role in the novel. And you pointed out all the characters have really specific ideas about themselves, and often the realities don't match up. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, How do you think the characters want to be seen in comparison to who they they actually turn out to be? Gosh, you know, I mean... I touched on it a little bit whenever we talked a bit at the beginning about uh, how I didn't like Jane at first mm-hmm. because everyone was kind of like, ugh, Jane, all she does at work, blah, blah, blah. She doesn't do anything. She's no fun. And, I mean, when you get inside Jane's head, she's so passionate about food. Mm-hmm. And she, she cares so much for her wife and her daughter. And, I mean, that's that's the big one for me is that everybody sees Jane as just this boring person who doesn't care about anything. And it, Inside, I mean, she's got a lot going on. She's she's so passionate about everyone in her life and her job. And I think that if Jane knew that that was how the other characters in the novel were seeing her, she would be heartbroken. I think so, too. Um, and Elizabeth as well. I mean, everyone kind of sees her as this clingy, boring real estate sa- salesman who all she cares about is being at Zoe's beck and call. And I think Elizabeth would take a lot of offense to that. Absolutely. And that's really how all the characters view her. It is. Maybe not Zoe. Um, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> I think Andrew views himself a lot cooler. Than oh, he is. yeah. <laughs> he views himself as, as trying to live this authentic, in quotation marks, life. Oh, he's and the saddest. He's just exhausting. <laughs> he I mean, really you get to the is. end and you're like, buddy, grow up. Get it together, just Andrew. Grow yeah. up. He, he, exhausting is a really good word for Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> he's truly exhausting. <laughs> and I think that, uh, I mean, it's. It really is the case for all of the characters. I mean, I mentioned it's kind of like the unreliable narrator, but everyone is the unreliable narrator mm-hmm. for themselves and for everyone uh, around them, really. I mean, everyone's kind of got their own opinions about the other characters, and it's so true to life, I think. Absolutely. I think Harry and Ruby may have the the best, maybe the most self-aware yes. of any of the characters. Yeah, I Ruby mean, knows what she's doing. Ruby knows what she's doing. Yeah. She knows that everyone sees her as a screw-up, and she freely admits to being a screw-up for right. a lot of things. Um, but she has a good heart mm-hmm. deep down, and you know Harry knows he's seen as a square and doesn't really seem to care all that much, right? Till he wants to impress Ruby, yeah, and then just sees himself as a, a lucky guy, who yeah, got a great girl, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, sweet. some of my favorite scenes, I have to be honest, were uh, Ruby Manning the hostess yeah. stand <laughs> at Hyacinth. They're so good, and I was just like, I've seen that teenager. Yeah, I've, I've seen that teenager in my day to day life. Just. I hate my job. I hate that I'm here. The bartender won't stop telling me jokes, and I'm sick of it. Yeah. And it's just it's so good. Now when I see that teenager, I'm going to know they ended up sailing around Mexico and opening a pizza joint. You look good for you. Good and for solve you. some crimes. And solve some crimes. In the exactly. meantime, <laughs> figured out that the kombucha was not being processed in a sterile the facility. The kombucha is not on the level. <laughs> Which is, I think that's the most Brooklyn thing I think I could, could think of. This is a very Brooklyn novel. It is, um, but if not you know. off-putting. It's true. It's true. I anytime I hear about a description and it's like it's about this group of trust fund people who live in very expensive yeah. houses, I'm just like, ugh, I don't want to read about that. Yeah, but one of, the first, one of the first reviews said I think called them, you know, all aging hipsters living yeah. in Brooklyn, and I thought, oh, that doesn't sound. But it really is a book more about relationships mm-hmm. and people, and everyone is very endearing in their own way. It's true. Yeah, I mean, and that's there's been so many books that I've said that, and I was just like, you know what? I'm, every, this is getting great reviews, and everyone seems to really like it. Emma Straub's a great writer. I'm going to give it a try, and I loved it. Yeah, it was a very good summer read. It is. I'm glad we picked it as our summer reading. Nobody Died, which was our that was our goal. <laughs> I was a little worried the cat went missing at one point. Yes. Even the cat came back. The cat everyone, was fine. Everyone was okay. Yeah, it was great. It was a wonderful summer read. Yeah. It was not stressful. It was no? just like... It's, you kind of go in knowing that even if somebody gets divorced, it'll be for the best. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Everything was fine. And and next up, we are taking a totally different, we're taking another right turn yes. in terms of books we're reading. The next one that we're doing is Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. So for all you HP fanatics, 
um, who were excited that JK has come out with a, a new one in the series. Get excited because that's the next one. That's uh, true. I've already read it. Yeah. So I've got the thoughts. <laughs> the thoughts are going. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm not podcasting with you on that one. Our, um, our children, a children's librarian from the Beaumont branch will be joining Alexa. Um, to give it that perspective, and they'll be talking about it. So yes. definitely stay tuned for our next episode. It should be very exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you and Kinsey are going to have a lot to talk about. I think so, too. I've got, got a lot of feelings about it. So I have a lot of feelings about it, and I haven't <laughs> even finished it yet. Oh, my gosh. I yeah. Know. Well, I mean, I read the first act, and I was like, all right. I had to, like, text my brother, and like, <laughs> I, I did, like, bounce some ideas off of, off of him. There's some time travel. It gets complicated. Yeah. So if you haven't read it, make sure you give it a read. Yes. And we'll be back next month with another installment. Thanks, guys.